Good afternoon and welcome to InfoPoint, AlphaPoint's online learning platform. For over 100 years, AlphaPoint has been a leader in the education and rehabilitation of those with vision loss. Today's webinar is the last in our expanded course series and focuses on sensory efficiency skills. Before we get started, we would like to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So this webinar is designed with accessibility in mind. If you have low vision, we do use yellow writing on a black background, which means that you may have to turn off any color inversion software. If you are using Zoom text, that key command is caps lock C. Across either the top or bottom of your screen, depending on how you have your Zoom set up, should be a sort of control ribbon. On this ribbon, you have the opportunity to post in a chat box. This is where you can share if you have information or ideas you want to share. There's also a Q&A box. And at the end of the webinar, we will do a question and answer portion. So as we're going through the webinar, if you have a question, feel free to type your question into that question box and we will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. Now you may have to touch your screen or wiggle your mouse because for most users, this will disappear automatically. So our objectives for today's webinar, we want to list the nine areas of the expanded core curriculum. We want to define sensory efficiency and we want to apply strategies for teaching sensory efficiency in the home. So the expanded core curriculum is a curriculum that is designed to help students with visual impairments. And there are, as we mentioned, nine areas. We're going to get into those areas in just a moment. Um, but the big thing about the expanded core curriculum is it aids in concept development. So when we think about concepts, concepts are sort of the overarching idea of something. So for example, the concept of computers. Within that concept, we have things like laptops, desktops, touch screens, different brands, Microsoft and Apple. So every single one of those things falls under that umbrella of a computer, but each one is its own unique piece in that. And our students without visual impairments, they are able to learn um, through primarily observation. In fact, over 80% of what we learn is visual. That's how our brains are hardwired. That is how our society has been set up. So a student with vision can look across a computer lab at school or the classroom where all the students have their devices and see these different devices, the teacher's desktop, the other students' laptops, the different brand names, and realize that these are all different types of computers. But for a child with low vision or no vision, we may have to be a little bit more strategic in how we teach them this and explain that this is a desktop, let's look at it or let's feel it, this is a laptop, here's how they're the same, here's how they're different. This also provides access to the regular education classroom. Many of the things that we have talked about throughout the series of the expanded core curriculum are designed to help our students access that education in the classroom with their sighted peers. And sensory efficiency is probably one of the biggest ones of this because it really sort of nicely ties up with a little bow everything that we've been talking about in this nine part series. So we have a graphic on here from Perkins School for the Blind that's just going to explain the expanded core curriculum in the 12 areas. So in the center, you have a gray puzzle piece that says core academics, because again, this sensory, the expanded core curriculum is designed to enhance those core academics, the reading, writing, math, science, social studies. Across, around it in a circle are colored puzzle pieces, each with a different uh, aspect of the expanded core curriculum. So from one o'clock to two o'clock in orange, we have sensory efficiency. That's the topic of today's webinar. From two or from about, yeah, two to three is assistive technology. Right at the three o'clock in blue is orientation and mobility. At the four to five o'clock in sort of dark magenta is social interaction. At the six o'clock in light green is self-determination. From six to seven in a brighter pink is independent living. At nine o'clock in light blue is recreation and leisure. 
from about the nine or 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock is career education in purple and from 11 to 12 in red is compensatory access and you can find our webinars on previous expanded core curriculum skills on our YouTube channel. And this graphic does come from Perkins School for the Blind. If you go to perkins.org slash school slash ECC for expanded core curriculum, you can find this graphic. So what exactly is sensory efficiency? Sensory efficiency is teaching our students with visual impairments how to make the most of their senses. There's a really common myth that when a person loses their vision that their other senses are just automatically heightened and that's not the case. You can't magically hear better because your vision is decreased. You simply learn how to use it more than somebody with vision. Again, for people with vision our brains are hardwired that minimum of 80 percent of the information we get about our environment is visual which means that we tend to tune out our other senses somebody with low vision or no vision is going to have to rely on those senses more than those sighted peers. So it can give the illusion that they are able to hear better or smell better or have better tactile sensitivity when in reality they've simply trained their brains to pay more attention. And so there's of course our five major senses, our visual sense, and you may say now hold on a minute. I thought this was a webinar about vision loss. Why are we talking about vision? But for our students with low vision, part of sensory efficiency is learning to use the vision that they have in the most effective way possible. Their hearing, of course, is the other, the second major sense. Their tactile sense, this can be a big one, particularly for our students who have total vision loss and read braille or rely much more on tactile cues. Taste is one of the five senses and smell. So it's learning to use all of the five senses to get as much information about the environment as you can to make up for the vision loss. But wait, there's more. So these are the five senses we're used to hearing about. We also have senses like our proprioception, which is having the sense of movement. So when you move your arms, you move your legs, you can feel your body moving. This is sometimes described as a sixth sense. There's also the vestibular sense. That's what your inner ear does for you. And it's kind of, are you upright? Are you laying down? Um, that's why when we tend to, if you go on a ride that spins a lot and it gets that vestibular system worked up and then you feel really dizzy. And so it's learning to use those five main senses, but also those other senses, your proprioception, your vestibular sense, to really get as much information about the environment as you can. And so there's a lot of strategies that we can use within the home, especially during a time when we may not be seeing our teachers of the visually impaired in person because of COVID-19 to be able to help our students develop these senses. So the first one is vision. And students with low vision, particularly if they were born or with vision loss or they lost their vision at a very young age, one of the things that I have found in working with them is that they very easily adapt because it's all they've known. Um, and so they have figured out how to find clues in their environment. Um, I think one of my favorite stories, I was working with a kindergartner with very, very low vision. And I would talk to the teachers and it was easy for them to forget that this child could not see very well at all because he was so good at using the vision he had to get information from his environment. And I think this hit home one day when our speech therapist was walking down the hall and he could see her from down the hall and he could always greet her by name but then she cut her hair and so one day she's walking down the hall and he had no clue who she was and she said in that moment she realized just how visually impaired he was because he couldn't see her face or the fine features he was seeing her outline and he had learned to distinguish her outline from the outline of other teachers within the school. And so when her outline changed and he could no longer use her hair and her outline as his clue as to who she was, he was no longer able to identify her from a distance. And that was the day that they realized just how visually impaired this child was because again, he was very good at masking it. But we still do need to give our kids some instruction in the best ways to use the vision they have. And the first one is to understand their own vision. So if you have a child that has color blindness, either they're missing um, some of the cones in their eyes, maybe, you know, we've had students that have, they cannot see any colors. And then we've had students that have some mild color loss. Um, so understanding what they can and cannot see, how close do they have to be? How big does the print have to be? 
having your students being able to verbalize what their eye condition is and what that means for them. You know, do they need to wear a hat and sunglasses in school for light sensitivity, that type of thing. So just getting your kids used to talking about their own vision loss and the accommodations they need for it so that it becomes a very natural thing that they can verbalize to their teachers and to their peers. Using large print when possible. The nice thing for really little children is that any book that you pick up that's a picture book is probably going to be large print. We don't use 12 print font for kindergartners. It gets, it gets a little trickier when we start getting into school age, but most libraries have a large print section. Um, Barnes and Noble has a large print section. If you want your child to just be able to go to a bookstore and pick a book off the shelf, and they have some uh, younger books like Hunger Games I've seen on the shelf. And of course, Wolfner Library, if you're in Missouri and in Kansas Talking Books, they all have large print books that you can check out. And then one of my favorite things to do is I use my Nook app on my iPad and that's not a special app that you have to buy. Um, you just use that to download the Barnes and Noble books. Amazon has the Kindle version. And on that, you can change the contrast and color of the font. You can change the size of the font and it's built into the app. Uh, it's not anything special that somebody has to do for visual impairment. So I always like when I can use something mainstream with my students because a lot of our students um, are sometimes as they get older, they're more sensitive about feeling different. Um, so anytime they can use something mainstream that doesn't cost them anything that their peers are also using, I always see that as a win-win. We can work with them on magnification. This can be something as simple as if you have a fixed handheld magnifier that they're using that they can explore with. They can try reading labels on packages or other print. If the student has a video magnifier, a handheld video magnifier, or a CCTV, or again, if they're using a magnification app on an iPhone or iPad, just letting them explore with it, getting used to using it, normalizing that experience for them so that it becomes something they don't have to think about all the time. Lighting is another big one, and this is, again, goes back to understanding your vision. How bright a light do I need? Are my eyes sensitive to light? Um, does the light need to be over my shoulder? And so using lighting to help them see better that, if I'm having trouble with something, I can turn on the light or I can use my task light. And sometimes that's all I need to be able to do that task visually. The next sense that we talk about a lot in the world of vision loss is hearing, because that's kind of your next major sense. And that's how a lot of our students get a lot of the information about their environment. So something simple you can do is just talk about sounds in the environment The you know, all of our appliances these days, I swear they sing songs to us when they're done like, oh, that little song means the dishwasher's done. Oh, that little song is the washer finishing its cycle or the stove um, timer stopping, you know, listening for things like when you're cooking, can you hear the meat sizzling? Can you hear the water boiling? If you have a, a kettle, oh, do you hear the whistle? That means the water's done. Um, you know, just any time that you're walking around of uh, something that we do with our students when we're somewhere like the mall, the, you can hear how the sounds change when you get to an open space versus a walkway where you've got stores on either side. Like, oh, did you hear how there's more echoes and the quality of the sound change? That means that we're in a wide open space like a food court. So again, just normalizing talking about those sounds in the environment. Traffic, we talked about a little bit on our O&M webinar. Um, this is how your students in orientation mobility, they learn when it's safe to cross by if they can hear the traffic. So, oh, I can hear the traffic is going parallel to us. It's going the same direction as us and it's on our right side. Or I can hear the traffic is crossing in front of me. It's perpendicular. Using that language can help them when they then practice those skills in orientation and mobility because again, they've gotten into that practice of it's something that they're hearing daily. And so it's not a new concept to them. Of course, audiobooks and materials. Uh, Audible is a great service. It's a subscription service and you can download audiobooks, podcasts, um, anything like that where uh, story time online is another one. It's a free YouTube channel where celebrities read stories to younger children. Listening for information really is its own skill. And it's hard because when we're listening, if we don't have that visual, we tend to automatically space out after a while, which is why when you go through training to present to audiences, they will always tell you, 
have visuals to keep your audience engaged. So for a child with very low vision or for a child with no vision and they're having to learn to listen without getting distracted, getting them again used to doing that can really help as they get older and they're having to listen to longer and more complex materials. So next one that we want to talk about is smell and taste. Um, so smelling, thinking about environmental cues. Uh, one of my favorites is walking by Bath and Body Works at the mall and they can smell Bath and Body Works and so they know where we are because we're walking by Bath and Body Works and you can smell it from a pretty good distance. Um, stores like Abercrombie and Fitch, Lush, they all have their own scent and they're all stores that you can smell from a pretty good distance and so we can use those to understand where we are in our environment. I'm talking about that smell you have after the rain. Like, oh, I can, I bet it just rained. I can, I, do you smell that? That's what it smells like right after it rains. Um, or you're walking by the food court and you can smell the garlic from the pizza place. Again, just kind of verbalizing all of that or asking your child, what do you smell? Where are we? You know, oh, I smell that garlic. What must be nearby? Um, so they get used to thinking about those environmental cues. You can use it to identify things like spoiled food. So you can't see the expiration date, but you can twist the top off the milk and give it a sniff and say, oh, I, that doesn't smell right. I think that means it's spoiled. And so teaching our ch children, particularly with total vision loss or very um, low vision, that they can use their sense of smell to identify things like food that's spoiled. Um, another one is clean clothes. You know, we, you forgot, to, your kid forgot to put their, their laundry away and now their basket's like half clean, half dirty. Well, you know what the scent of your soap or your dryer sheets is. And so I can give my clothes a sniff test and yes, this one's clean. I can put in the drawer. Oh no, that one needs to go to the laundry. Um, and that's again, something our sighted kids do too. So not necessarily something different. Um, as we've said in previous webinars, just something that we have to rely more on than our sighted peers. Of course, the tactile sense is one of the big ones, particularly for our students with more significant vision loss. Um, and so one thing that we want to talk about with our kids is tactile discrimination. So this is where my husband hates shopping with me. Anytime I'm setting up a sensory area for a child with vision loss, this is one of the first senses I focus on. And so we'll be walking through the stores and I'm literally petting everything as I walk by, or at least I was pre-COVID, maybe not so much now. But craft stores are a great place for this because you can get uh, different textures of material. You know, velvet's got that kind of crinkly texture. Silk has that kind of more, and linen have kind of more of a nubby texture. Um, you can typically find like rabbit pelts and they've got that really soft fur, different grits of sandpaper. Um, and so what we find a lot in our sensory areas in the schools is that they'll have different things the kids can touch and get used to telling the difference between this material on this shirt is really, it's got a certain thickness to it, it has a certain slickness to it, so I know by touch which shirt this is, whereas this cotton shirt has a totally different feel, so I know that that's not a work shirt, that's a t-shirt that I can use for bumming around the house. Um, so again, just any craft stores are great for this. I love them for tactile discrimination because you can find a lot of things that feel different um, for pretty inexpensive and you can kind of make your own tactile discrimination area. I used clear shoe boxes in my classroom to have the different things that they could touch, but you could also um, cut if you've got, if they're flat things like pieces of fabric or sandpaper, you can always cut them up and put them on a board that the kids can run their hands over. A lot of kids really enjoy that. Um, thinking about search techniques. So a search technique is something like I've got my cup and let's just say that I've got the bottom of the table. You know, I run my hand along the bottom of the table and cup it so that then I tactily encounter my cup without knocking it over. So teaching how to use your sense of touch to find things that are on the table that have been dropped. Um, and again, being able to tactily discriminate between those things. Games are another great one. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, a favorite that we like to use at Alpha Point is shut the box. This is also great for teaching math skills. You can get dice with raised bumps on them. And so the students have to get used to being able to feel the bumps on the dice to know what the number is. And then most shut the box um, games have a velvet sort of interior that you roll a dice on. So it gives you that nice tactile sense. 
we have a braille version here at alpha point um, i had one that was given to me by one of my professors in school that i just put braille labels on or if it's a younger kid you can even put on different textures and have them matching the textures instead of counting so you can the games are pretty easy to adapt um, one of my favorite games if you go to aph.org is web chase and on that game, you're like a spider and you're crawling around the web to collect your prey. You have a little lunch tray. And one of the versions that you can do with that game is the bugs have different textures. And so you can say this texture is a butterfly. This texture is a grasshopper. And this texture is a fly. And so they have to collect the different textures to fill up their lunch tray. So a game like that is something that you could make if you have things flying around the house or you can go to aph.org they have a lot of really good games like that that you can do to help your children continue to develop that tactile sense and there's more so we talked a little bit about that we have that vestibular that proprioceptive that where is my body in space am i sitting still am i moving and so there's some different things that we can do to help our children get that what we call that body sense Swinging is a great one that really activates that vestibular sense, that inner ear, the fluid in your inner ear as you swing sort of sloshes around. And so as you're swinging and you can feel the gravity and you can activate that inner ear sense that really helps kids get an awareness of their own body, which, is, which can be difficult for a child, particularly one that has total vision loss. Um, as playgrounds are reopening to COVID, swings there um, you can buy there's swings that you can buy from companies like abilitations that you can hang up in your house i know a lot of families of children with not just vision loss but any type of sensory um, disorder really like swings because they can really help calm and center a child and there's ones that you can hang from your ceiling or from a tree that not just go back and forth but side to side and can even spin a little bit um, and they and a lot of children when they get overwhelmed with sensory input can also find that very calming trampolines are another good one um, sometimes we'll see our children um, with sensory uh, with sensory needs not just vision some sometimes with vision loss but also just children with autism or other sensory needs that you'll find they really like to stomp because they're getting they're really needing that feedback from the sole, so, soles of their feet in the ground and so a trampoline where they can just really jump and really just get that real um, serious tactile feedback while they're jumping because um, they can get that that force of the trampoline through the soles of their feet but then they also activate that vestibular proprioceptive sense with the movement um, and the jumping that's another really common one and in, um, in my old classroom when I taught in public school I had just one of those little round jogger trampolines doesn't have to be a big one and when i could tell a kid was getting frustrated or overwhelmed it was let's go take a jump break and a lot of times that really helped kind of reset um, so that they are ready to go into the lesson spinning's another good one um it you know an office chair or just have them see a silly song spin around. Um, there's a, a device called a sit and spin that's really good. Um, anytime they can spin, again, that, that activates that vestibular sense. The, some of the kids I've worked with love to spin until I get dizzy just watching them. But again, it's really helping them to get that sense of where their body is in space so they can continue to develop that sense. Uh, kick bands on chairs. This is uh, something for our children with more significant vision loss is this concept of grounding. Again, where is my body in space? Chairs in classrooms um, may not be the right size for our kids. And so when their feet are hanging, that can be very difficult for them because if they can't, if they don't have vision to see their environment and where they are and their feet aren't touching the ground, they kind of feel lost in space. So taking an elastic band, uh, typically like a therapy band, or maybe one that you would find at Target for uh, stretching exercises, tie it around the legs of the chair and then the child can kick against it to give them something to ground themselves. Or as a fellow short person whose feet do not touch the ground at work, I like to use a step stool. That can be another way that we can help them ground themselves, um, particularly our students with total vision loss um, need some way to kind of feel like their feet are firmly planted on the ground and that can help activate that sense. And then something I really love for my kids, stress balls. Squishy balls are a great one because again, it gives them that tactile feedback 
and they can squish it and they can start to develop that strength in their hands. And the other nice thing about squishy balls is if you have a child who's a braille reader, um, over your brain cannot, when you first start learning braille, we really recommend um, keeping it to about 20 minutes of reading because after a while you start to get tactile fatigue. And so then stop, take a squishy break and the act of squishing that ball will get the blood flowing back into the fingertips and kind of revamp that tactile sensitivity. Um, so the nice thing about sensory efficiency is these are, is a lot of these, these techniques are things that we already have around the home that we can do within our daily life to help our kids get, um, get used to using those senses in a way that their sighted peers maybe don't have to rely on quite so much. And Alpha Point can help. We do have our expanding youth experiences. Um, we are working on what that's going to look like for the fall with COVID-19. I know that we had to take, unfortunately, our camps had to be canceled this summer, our adventure camps where we would work on a lot of these skills due to COVID-19 because safety is our first priority. But we are looking into how we can safely provide those expanding youth experiences this fall. If you're not yet on our email list, um, you can sign up on our email list on our website, www.alphapoint.org, and we can make sure that you're getting those emails so you know that when those start back up and you can sign up for those. We have our rehabilitation services, and so our comprehensive rehab services for our students who are transition age, we work a lot on these sensory efficiency skills, particularly in activities of daily living, where we're teaching our students how to clean, cook, do laundry, manage time, all of those things that you're doing at school and at home to maintain your independence rely a lot on those sensory efficiency skills. We have our low vision clinic. So when we talked about wanting to make sure that our students can use the vision they have, all of those things, the lighting, the magnification and contrast, Dr. Metzger can look at and say, here is specifically what your child needs. And a low vision exam in the world of teaching students with visual impairments is the gold standard. Um, and so it is, if you haven't had one for your child yet, the big difference between your typical eye doctor and our doctor is we don't replace your eye doctor visit. Your child's eye doctor is going to say, what can we medically do to help this child use or to help this child stop their vision loss or maybe even correct some of their vision loss. Our eye doctor, Dr. Metzger says, we know that the vision loss you have is permanent. How can we help you make the most of the vision you have at this time? And he looks at those magnification lighting contrast and then your teacher, the visually impaired can take that information to make sure that your child has the right accommodations in their school. We have our connecting point store. And so we have things like, um, like liquid level indicators that beep or buzz when you fill a cup to a certain level, you know, auditory watches, things like that. And we have our new info point store, which I believe Jake is going to post in our chat section, uh, the link to that. In fact, he just did. And one of the new things we have, I have it here on the screen, is called the Sonic Search Ball. And I'm gonna stop our screen share for a second. So I'm holding up the package with this Sonic Search. This is a new product in our info point store. This is a fun activity for students with visual impairments um, and those without visual impairments because this goes in a pool, you throw it in, and then it beeps and the idea is trying to find it underwater before the timer goes out. And so I'm going to demonstrate it for just a second. I'm going to push the button here. Ready to play Sonic and so you can hear that that Sonic search ball has different patterns, different beeps. And so that can be a really fun activity. It's made to be used underwater. You don't have to use it underwater. Um, and you can pick that up in our new info point store. Um, where did my screen, sh I'm going to go back to the screen share if I can get my computer to cooperate. Share. And I don't know why it. And so at this time, if you have any questions or anything that you would like to share, um, if you again you can go to www.alphapoint.org and there is an e on the end of alpha point that is where you can sign up for services 
or ask questions about what is coming up next, or you can call our main number, 816-421-5848. And right now, um, as Jake mentioned, we only have about six products online in our store, but there are more products available um, that I think will be coming out. This is new to all of us. And let's see, are there any quest any other questions on sensory efficiency today? Well, while we give people a chance to type, we do want to say tune in next week. Our next uh, webinar will be on wearables. This has been a very requested topic. So we're doing a two part series. Mark Myers will be one of our guest panelists next week. He is a college student, recent graduate who uses the eSight glasses. Um, he was one of the first users of them in the United States, um, even recently did a study abroad in Hong Kong for a year. And so he's going to talk about his experience with the eSight glasses. And then not next week, but the week after, we'll be doing the second part of our wearable series on devices for those with total vision loss. After that, we have a three-part series on employment coming up and then a four-part series on back to school. And Jake has posted the information so you can also find on our website information about InfoPoint. And so he's posted the information about our two-part wearable series, which of course July 2nd is magnification and July 9th is auditory. And so we'll be able to show devices such as the OrCam, eSight, Jordi, um, Ira and some of those devices that we know there's been lots of questions on. Well, if there are no further questions, we want to thank you for joining us today for InfoPoint, and we will hopefully see you again next week when we do start our two-part wearable series. Thank you, everyone.